We now move to an examination of California's contribution to blockchain regulation. Our fireside chat is with Christopher Groshung of Coinstructive, who's going to be the moderator. And with Chris are two of California's leaders with respect to blockchain regulation and so much more on the technological front. Um, California Assembly Majority Leader Ian Calderon is going to be joined by California Senate Majority Leader Robert Hertzberg with Chris to discuss the California Blockchain Working Group update and the various forms of legislation that the two legislative leaders are developing to place California at the forefront of blockchain innovation and regulation. We're really excited to have uh, both Assembly Majority Leader uh, Calderon and uh, Senate Majority Leader Robert Hertzberg with us today, and I'll leave this with Chris to continue the conversation. Welcome, everybody, to the California Blockchain Legislative Panel. I'm your moderator, Chris Groshaw, and I'm joined today by the majority leaders of both California's Assembly and Senate, the California Assembly Majority Leader, uh, Ian Calderon, and Senate Majority Leader, Bob Hertzberg. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. So, um, Assembly Member Calderon, you want to give us a quick introduction uh, to yourself and then followed by Senator Hertzberg? Sure. Uh, I was elected in 2012 at the age of 27. Uh, first, the First millennial ever elected to the state legislature in 2016, I became the majority leader, the youngest majority leader in the history of the state of California. Uh, I've loved every minute of being in the legislature, uh, most notably working on a lot of tech issues. Uh, and as this group would know, working on blockchain, crypto type issues over the last couple of years, because I've noticed the, the opportunities that can come from this industry and, and you know what we could do in California with this technology. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of opportunities to work with my great colleague on these issues uh, in the Senate, and we, we, we just completed our work with the Blockchain Working Group, which is a group that we set up a couple years ago, and we'll be submitting our report to the legislature actually now. Uh, so we're excited about what's going to be coming from that uh, and excited to be a part of this panel. Great. Thanks. Senator. Senator uh, Hertzberg. <clears throat> I love working with Ian. I love the perspective and uh, the energy he brings to this process. Um, I served as speaker of his house, the California Assembly, 20 years ago. Um, and I'm majority leader. Uh, I left government for 12 years and I traveled the world. I took two companies public in the uh, solar space, but it really wasn't solar. It was just kind of the high tech uh, energy space and um, had offices in Germany and China and Sri Lanka and Indonesia and uh, Africa and been all over the world to recruit stuff and came back to government. Um, have always been deeply interested in technology and think that uh, this is an area where we, you know, one of the great challenges in government, wherever you are, is that government is, is, is bait, looks backwards all the time. There, there are places where it's hard to invent the future. It's hard to crack the status quo and all of the people that are comfortable, the folks that have relationships. And so when you work in blockchain or crypto or any of these areas, you know, the fact that you've got the majority leader in the assembly and me pushing this kind of stuff, it's very slow and very challenging, but you know, you've got this great brand of California for all your people that are listening from all other parts of the world, whether from Korea or China. And, um, you know, we face the same challenges despite what we see in Silicon Valley or Silicon Beach down in Los Angeles and the like. But it's, uh, it's very, very difficult in government to begin to figure out how to regulate, do the kinds of things that are necessary to regularize these new kinds of thinking. And so with that, I will turn it back over to you and happy to answer any further questions. And very happy to be here with my handsome friend for many, many years, Mr. Calderon. He does have a good set of hair, I'll tell you that. He does. Um, he's a great athlete. Let me tell you something. He's a better athlete than he's a legislator. He's one of these natural guys you hate that no matter what he plays, he's perfect at it. <laughs> uh, could, could be worse. Could be worse. No, you uh, could really. All right. So for those of you who don't know me, again, my name is Chris Groshong, and I'm uh, the San Diego chapter lead for the GBA, the Government Blockchain Association, as well as uh, the, one of the co-organizers for the largest Bitcoin meetup group in San Diego. I'm also a founding member 
of the Unifactized Conferences community partner, the San Diego Blockchain Forum. I'm a certified fraud investigator who focuses on helping victims of cryptocurrency scams and thefts. And in 2019, I served as an expert witness in a federal fraud case involving Bitcoin and Monero. But my foray into policy and legislation advocacy work started actually back in 2016 when my company, Coinstructive, helped co-sponsor along with Microsoft and Block um, a document called uh, uh, Protecting Consumers in the Digital Currency Economy. And it was published by the Consumers Research Group out of Washington, D.C. And in 2017, I, pro I was a proponent of and helped shape the Uniform Law Commission's URVCBA, which is the Uniform Regulation of the Virtual Currencies Businesses Act, which we'll get into a little bit later. And through my volunteer efforts with the California Blockchain Working Group, um, I'm hoping to help shape that legislation of California. And I was feel very fortunate enough to be able to get to know the both of you and work with you um, uh, over this time. So this has been really great. And so I want to jump right into you know, the, the two of you are the only leg California legislators who have proposed bills or enacted anything that's related to blockchain or cryptocurrency. And so I want to start with the one where the two of you work together jointly on, which is how I got to know all of you, which is AB 2658, which you mentioned uh, Majority Leader Calderon about the California Blockchain Working Group. And it was co-authored by you, Majority Leader Hertzberg. So, um, and you mentioned that they're just getting ready to release the report that they worked on for the last 12 months or so. So I was kind of curious, uh, Mr. Calderon, uh, Majority Leader Calderon, where did you and your passion for blockchain and distributed ledger technologies come from? What was your goal by trying to initiate the bill to start the working group? So, you know, I wasn't necessarily familiar right away uh, about blockchain technology. I mean, I think like a lot of people, you've heard of different cryptocurrencies uh, like Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, but I mean, at least for myself, and, and I'm still learning every day, but at least for myself, I really had no understanding of uh, what these uh, what these technologies were and um, what blockchain was. Uh, and as I got to uh, talking to some of my staff, I asked them to put together something uh, to help me understand blockchain a little bit. I mean, of course, I went on Google and tried to read as much as I could to understand blockchain, cryptocurrency, how they work together, um, which is great. Uh, but then I started thinking about, you know, there are so many things, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the Legislative uh, Tech and Innovation Caucus. And so, you know, I want to find ways that we can modernize government so that it can be more effective and more efficient in the job uh, that it does in helping our constituents. When you try to go to EDD and get some help because of unemployment benefits or disability benefits, whatever it is, you know, it feels like it just takes forever. It's a long process and that they're significantly undergone. But if we have technologies that can help speed up that process and make them more effective and more efficient, that's what we need to be doing as a government. Uh, when I take a look at voter participation, uh, you know, I see voter participation as something absolutely paramount. It is paramount when it comes to a functioning democracy, but, you know, getting people to show up to vote uh, or even fill out an absentee ballot now as you hear all this political rhetoric around it now being a corrupt process or e easily corruptible process. Um, you know, you need to find ways to be creative, to engage people, get them to participate in democracy. And so being able to use your phone uh, to vote is something that I think is in our future. Uh, but you need to be able to have an underlying technology that can secure the validity of the elections and make sure people are confident in its ability to deliver the results uncorrupted. Uh, and so, you know, as I looked into these things and learned a little bit more block about blockchain, it just seemed like this is a natural technology that can fill a lot of these holes and fill a lot of these voids. Uh, we're also California where we're a tech leader. And uh, I want this state to continue to be a leader uh, for the future in tech. And the only way we're going to do that is by recognizing and legitimizing uh, through regulation, uh, you know, technologies like blockchain. And there are just so many different applications. And, and, you know, there are a lot of applications now, and they're going to continue to be new developments and new applications that are uh, in the future. But there's such a, 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 an apprehension among the legislature to take action on these types of issues because it is new, it's unknown. Uh, and, you know, when you don't know something, you don't understand something, uh, you would rather just legislate it into oblivion so that it can't exist because you're afraid of it rather than, you know, put some guardrails up and say, okay, here's, here's where you can move forward. And so that's what really uh, motivated me to work with the Majority Leader Hertzberg to create the Blockchain Working Group uh, so that we can come up with the best uses, practices, and potential regulations 
when it comes to blockchain technology. But to have a panel of experts, you know, from the tech side, business side, all the way to the con consumer protection side, say, okay, here, look at this is what you can look at uh, to help further California's blockchain initiative, uh, but do it in a way that's not only going to be beneficial to business, but also provide that that certainty when it comes to consumer protection that is really necessary. And I want this technology to flourish in California because I know us and I know our ability to properly regulate technologies and to be able to have our touch. And, you know, if it can work here, it can work anywhere, but we need to be able to have our touch and to be able to serve as a model for what other states uh, and potentially the national, the federal government, at least federal regulators can look at in terms of what works and what's viable and what's not viable. And so that was the point of the blockchain working group and why I moved, uh, why we wanted to move in that direction. And I think that we were able to cover a lot of ground and create, including creating a, uh, a definition of blockchain, which was very difficult, but essentially the, the definition of blockchain that we decided was acceptable is that blockchain is a domain of technology used to build decentralized systems that increase the verifiability of data shared among a group of participants that may not necessarily have a pre-existing trust relationship. Any such system must include one or more distributed ledgers, specialized data stores that provide a mathematically verifiable ordering of transactions recorded in the data store. It may also include smart contracts that allow participants to automate pre-agreed business processes. These smart contracts are implemented by embedding software and transactions recorded in the data store. It's a lot there, but it took a long time, virtually the entirety of the meetings that we had to come up with that definition of blockchain so that we can be clear on what we believe blockchain is, but not too overly prescriptive so that we cut ourselves out of whatever future technology and whatever future uh, you know, life this technology takes on. So I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with where we're at, but now this, the legislature will need to act based on the report. Yeah, so Majority Leader, Senate Majority Leader Hertzberg, I'm going to direct this question to you. So how do you think this report will affect the passing of future blockchain legislation in the state? Um, let me just frame it. I got interested in blockchain um, for a couple of reasons. Back in a little more than 10 years ago, I was in Estonia and I saw what they did in Estonia. I think it started in 2007. And, um, you know, one of the great challenges we're facing with this explosion of the Internet is privacy. We did a privacy bill uh, and measure here in California was it in 2018. We've gotten one on the ballot now. You know, this, hor this balance where on the one hand, we're trying to take advantage of this extraordinary technology that helps people in so many ways, but it has these extraordinary unintended consequences in the form of the privacy issues that uh, monetize, a lot of businesses are allowed to monetize. What the blockchain I saw was really interesting, both from a government perspective and a privacy perspective, it was a way to create trust. It's what Ian said, the most important word, trust in the system, that you don't have phony people and fakery and the kind of stuff you've got to do and chasing down fraud. Secondly, as we begin to develop the larger dynamic of this technology and what it can do, whether it's food security, go down the list of all the incredible opportunities that blockchain has. Some companies have started to deal with it, some of the jurisdictions have started to deal with it, vaccines and healthcare issues and this stuff. It's just, when you marry the trust issue, its opportunities are incredible. But the point that Ian made is the most important. When you start this process, you just can't jump in and start it. It makes people's hair go on fire. They don't know. It's too insecure. They don't know too many companies and interests or what is impact to labor in terms of can you track employees? What's the impact on businesses? Are you creating a competitive advantage over one business or another? And it just gets gummed up in the works of government where everybody's voices are screaming at the top of their lungs and you don't get work together. I started out and I wanted to do, after meeting with the Prime Minister of Vanuatu, I wanted to do real estate transactions. But you can imagine what the title insurance companies said to me when that happened. So, you know, I ended up doing a cucaracha bill involving uh, shares and interest to be able to, I could talk about a little bit later, when you're transferring your shares in a company. But what Ian said is critical. You got to start out with a framework of credible people you got to understand what the hell blockchain is and create a definition. I remember I went to the tech caucus and talked about my blockchain bill. Somebody leaned over and bumped me and said, what's blockchain, right? They think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the chain around your swimming pool. They didn't know. 
And so you've got to get the credibility, the framework. It was a necessary starting point. It's slower than I like to work, but it is absolutely as essential of a building block to be able to then work on and gradually move into, whether it's marriage certificates, death certificates, title companies, all the other kinds of things that Ian talked about that will ultimately roll into, but you have to build the foundation. You got to pour the concrete with some rebar. And that's what Ian Calderon's build did. Yeah. So that actually kind of leads me right into the next question for both of you is what do you think can be done to actually bridge the knowledge gap with your colleagues? Is it more hands-on like approach or like wh what do you think is, is the right way to get them up to speed so they can make informed decisions when they vote on these bills that you're both proposing? Well, can I, you know, look, I, I think that, you know, I turn on the television set and I see the commercials by uh, IBM using blockchain technology or the stories of coffee, you know, to trace your stuff, food technology. There's some applications that are quite attractive um, when people are worried about whether something's contaminated. If you remember the Tylenol case where the, everything was pulled off the shelf. Well, if you had blockchain, you wouldn't have had to do that, right? So there's a lot of attractiveness in the private sector as it begins to start to grow. And my sense is, is as you marry those things, we've seen in many other jurisdictions in Texas and all across the country where other states are starting to do it. And, and you're starting to see in conferences, the National Speakers Conference, the Majority Leaders Conference, the, the, the various legislative conferences of these things starting to create some legitimacy. Because what happens is, you know, in the beginning, the internet was all about pornography. In the, in, the, in the beginning, blockchain was only about Bitcoin. And people are beginning to understand its, its extraordinary dimension and applicability. You know, on smart contracts, one of the great things we have in California, which organized labor is a big deal, they're really worried about uh, people, uh, you know, with wage theft. Well, smart contracts, you can avoid the wage theft problem. These are new tools available to government. So by socializing these with some of the traditional constituencies, the environmental community, labor community and the like, I think you're gonna see in very short order, this really growing dramatically as a very viable technology that helps us in so many ways. Great, so um, actually I wanted to ask you, uh, Majority Leader Hertzberg, uh, so you know, some of the recommendations in the, from the California Blockchain Working Group report are already being proposed as bills. And so, you know, well, can you talk a little bit about uh, Senate Bill 373 uh, and also then talk about Senate Bill 838? I don't know numbers. I've been this. Busy. So, 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 so which ones? Which I know subjects. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, three seven three is the county recorders, the vital records, and then the second one is the corporate records, the uh, articles of incorporation. Okay. So, with the corporate records one, it, it goes back to what I was saying in the first meeting. Like, what the hell is blockchain? I just wanted to stand on the Senate floor to explain what blockchain is, how it worked to my colleagues. Right. That's just the honest answer. And so, what happens is, you know, I wanted to start out with I said with, with land title. Well, I'd put, I'd put the title companies out of business because with blockchain, they're a scammerino. They don't exist anymore because you can validate a, a title. You don't need to spend all the dough on a, uh, all that money yep. on, 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 on that stuff. So I, I wanted to find a place where I could at least enter, put my toe in the water. And what happened was a few years earlier, we had a problem where um, somebody had stolen money out of a transaction up in San Francisco on something. And the idea was, you know, they basically, the way you steal money, as you know, Mr. Fraud Investigator, is you go in and you sign a phony baloney uh, resolution. You give it to the bank with the articles of incorporation. If you work for ABC Co, you f open an account for ABC Co, you steal their checks and you move them to your account versus their account. Well, if you had the articles of incorporation, which had a blockchain requirement for shareholding interest, you, the bank would say, okay, are you a shareholder? Well, at that point, you, you were caught, right? So the idea was here, and we had, an, we had a situation in Southern California, a situation in Northern California. So I used those as examples and made it voluntary. And we've seen some companies do this, you know, to, to begin to put their ledgers on blockchains. The only purpose was what was the easiest way I could get the argument without getting blown up by all the interest groups. That was honest answer. Second thing is I wanted vital records. And when I got to the privacy committee in the other house, they gave me a big haircut and they took out death certificates and birth certificates. They left it to marriage certificates. I think it's done in, well, what, you know, Ian, what's the state that, that does marriage certificates? Um, 
uh, uh, Washoe County, Nevada does marriage certificates. And they gave me a haircut on that because too many people were worried, but the, the folks in the marriage certificate world said it was okay because you got to talk to the clerks. You know, this is a world we got to talk to these guys. In my view, again, just getting your nose under the tent. So those were just efforts to begin to introduce the technology. And as Mr. Calderon was saying, getting members, it's so hard to get members comfortable with new ideas. And this was just those efforts to try to do that. Okay, cool. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that it, you know, we take for granted that you have to run the the gauntlet essentially to get things done uh, at the highest levels. So we we appreciate all of your efforts to to get things uh, you know enacted. But the um, secret the secret weapon you've got here is you've got the majority leader in the Senate helping the majority leader in the Assembly, and you've got the majority leader in the Assembly helping the majority leader in the Senate. Otherwise, none of this stuff would pass. <laughs> I, I I totally understand. <laughs> yes, I I can see where that's coming from. Um, so I kind of want to stay on the topic of, of corporations and, and blockchains and, and as, uh, Majority Leader Calderon, could you talk a little bit about AB 2150 that you introduced earlier this year? Yeah, how AB, <clears throat> AB 2150 was just uh, clarifying uh, what digital assets should qualify under California law as a security. You know, and, you know, when, I, when we were figuring out what we wanted to do, because I wanted to do a cryptocurrency specific bill, but I also wanted to do something that was going to pass. I mean, uh, what Senator Hertzberg said is absolutely true. You try to start with the low hanging fruit, uh, you know, so that you can move the conversation forward because once you get here, it's easier to get here rather than going from here to there. So, um, you know, I sat down with a couple of industry folks along with uh, Manny Alvarez, commissioner over at DBO, who's, who's our regulator. You got to tell the, people in, in Korea and the rest of the world what CBO is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, we, we sat there, we sat down and uh, tried to figure out, okay, what would be the best approach uh, when it comes to, you know, allow, creating some law that will provide some certainty, some regulatory certainly, certainty, legal certainty to the crypto uh, world, but also provide uh, some, some help to our regulator, which is the DBO. So <clears throat> ultimately, uh, we landed on clarifying that certain digital assets like blockchain Ethereum uh, do not qualify as securities. And, and, you know, we didn't just kind of come up with this. I mean, as you know, and I'm sure people are, are looking, when you take a look at the SEC and their, their no, their 14 page notes and, and everything that they've been saying, you know, they, they've already said that these digital assets should not be considered um, securities. And what's, what's really difficult for a lot of, cryptocurrency companies is that the only way uh, if, you know, somebody brings a legal action, the only way to, 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 to have this issue adjudicated is by going to court and having the Howey test applied to it, uh, which is a judicial test. And so this isn't something that can be done until you're in the court. Uh, and, you know, so looking at what the SEC has already done, looking at previous case law, we decided on clarifying uh, that certain digital assets do not qualify as securities. Uh, right away, it became... Uh, difficult in dealing with the DAs uh, and ultimately difficult with dealing with the, the Department of Justice. Uh, and so we had to pivot a little bit, but basically when it comes to the DAs and the Department of Justice, you know, the prosecutors, prosecutors, they already have a lot of power, uh, but part of that power is derived from uh, potentially um, uh, uncertainty in the law, uh, being able to not have something necessarily so specific that they can uh, take advantage of that and, and use it as a broad net to capture a lot of folks. And uh, they like having that ability. And so the DAs in the Department of Justice raised some serious concerns over the last two weeks and we've been trying to work through, but essentially what they told me was that no matter what, we are not gonna be okay with this bill uh, in, in moving forward, even though we received you know, 60 plus votes on the assembly floor bipartisan. Uh, but you know, when you have you know, the DAs is one thing. When you have the Department of Justice, you need to take that very seriously. And what we want is to move something forward that's going to have some type of an impact and be some type of signal to the industry to come to California, do business in California. We want to be uh, the hub for, you know, the world's financial future. Uh, and only we're not going to do that unless we pass policies like this. Uh, but we decided to roll it back a little bit and take a smaller bite at the apple, uh, which is now uh, going to focus on, having the DBO do a report uh, or, or, or a study on uh, creating a safe harbor in California for these companies. 
Uh, and the SEC has already provided documentation. They've already provided opinions on uh, Rule 156. So I, I think that, you know, there's, there's an opportunity for this to happen. Uh, and so what we want is to direct DBO to start working on this so that we can then have this information provided back to the legislature and that it can be enacted in the law. But my good friend here, Senator Hertzberg, because uh, uh, I'll be gone next year. But, you know, if we can have this move forward, I think it would it would signal to the industry that we are serious, we are moving forward with this. It may have to be in smaller steps, smaller chunks than we really wanted to, uh, but uh, the safe harbor is absolutely something that can happen in California. We just need DBO to do it. And the DBO, they really want this. They wanted 2150 because the reality is, is that if you're a cryptocurrency company, you reach out to the DBO and they say, and you say, hey, am I a security? They're gonna say, well, we don't think so, but we don't know because the law is unclear. And so we wanted to clarify that law, but yeah. the Department of Justice, uh, th their their opposition is just, it's just too strong to overcome in a short period of time and given the dynamics that we're in right now. So by directing the DBO to do this report on a potential safe harbor in California, I think is the right way to go. And once that report is done, you're having the DBO, who is the regulator of this industry, basically signaling not only to the governor who has to sign the bill, but also to the legislature that, this is how we can do it. And us as a regulator, we want this. And so I think it's a great bill. Uh, certainly has a great opportunity to pass. And so we're going to be working on that. And the bill's now in the Senate. Uh, it'll go to the Senate, get through the Senate, hopefully come back to assembly and concurrence. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that that bill has certainly a strong shot at passing. Oh, that's fantastic. A safe harbor is definitely something that uh, can, can be beneficial to many companies who are trying to figure things out as they progress here in, in through the state. Uh, I, I did want to shift gears a little bit to the privacy aspect, especially that you were mentioning earlier, uh, Majority Leader Hertzberg. I'm, I was, you know, California passed its version of the GDPR, the CCPA recently. And so what concerns do you have over privacy and data control when it comes to utilizing blockchain technology? I actually think that, uh, I think that, that it, blockchain technology dovetails quite nicely into the privacy conversation. You know, as, as we began to experiment with the internet, when I was here as speaker, you know, I mean, uh, Google had just came incorporated, right? So it, September 30th, 1998, it was incorporated, didn't exist, right? And, and the, the, it was the, the internet was so much involved with academia and the like, and now it's just exploded and the ability to monetize so much on the internet and, and advertising and track people and the like, it's been quite challenging. And so as we drafted the CCPA, we subsequently have a new measure that is gonna be up before the voters in California, which strengthens the CCPA. Basically, it deals with two, three broad factors. One, it, it deals with a lot of the nuances that we had problems with under CCPA, dealing with workability too. Um, it creates an agency because the attorney general's place was just not a place that worked where you wanted, as Mr. Calderon was saying, this regulatory structure and architecture that could work rather than the architecture in the law enforcement arena. And third, it strengthens consumer protections for sensitive personal information and children. So we've really done a good job. We think that for those who are in the audience who understand this, we think that there's a high chance of us getting data adequacy. Uh, with the EU, with the GDPR. If that happens, the business impacts in California will be extraordinary. I know there's a lot of interest in Europe um, to, to partner with California. It would be just an, an unbelievable step forward for the EU to partner with a, a single state. So it's a, it's a big deal. And I personally think that when we deal with privacy, one, the next real big step in this kind of continuum of where we're going with technology is a, a, a maturing of the blockchain technology, not in the crypto side, but in all of the other um, commercializations that we can do that will dramatically um, improve privacy because you're going to, all your data is going to be encrypted. You're going to know it, it's going to be marked in a way that you can control it. And I think you're going to end up seeing uh, uh, you know, what has been talked about among, with Mr. Yang, who was running for president, the governor talked about it in one of his, of California, one of the state of the states, of data dividends, of people being able to earn money and control over their own data. And I think it's going to be, it's, it's a really important conduit in terms of really both dealing with privacy and I think really in a significant way to monetize the internet that just doesn't find itself in the hands of a handful of people, but is able to, it's just like a distributed ledger, will distribute cash to people by virtue of their participation in the internet.
uh, place of commerce. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that's great. That's good to hear. I didn't know that was, was coming out. Um, I want to. I want to kind of switch. switch that's gears why you have us here because we're giving you the real scoop. That's you're right. Enjoy the leaders, don't you want? <laughs> you, 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 the audience didn't want to just come in and listen to BS. They want to listen to the real stuff. This is it. It's coming down the pipe, everybody. So I want to switch gears a little bit to banking. Um, and you know, back in October of, of last year, uh, I attended the joint hearing of the Banking and Finance Select Committee on Technology Advances. It's where I think we first. One of the times we first spoke, Majority Leader Calderon, and this event was attended by the Banking and Finance Committee Chair, Assemblymember Monique Lamone, as well as the, the California DBO, as well as several key figures from the cryptocurrency industry, like former general counsel to Coinbase and now acting comptroller of the currency, Brian Brooks. Right, And it was just a few weeks prior to that then when Governor, Governor Newsom passed the, the law to give the ability to let uh, public banks Become in, come into existence. And also in 2019, Wyoming passed a law, HB 0074, to allow for non-fractional reserve custodial banking using digital assets uh, for like an, a new type of bank, basically. Um, the California Blockchain Working Group report talks about this idea of a, of a Cal coin. And I was, and you know, and you know, it's particularly relevant with the concept of the digital dollar being floated to Congress recently. And so with this concept of, you know, a state chartered bank and digital assets, which have tremendous interest from the community, uh, but this is really for either of you. Do, do you believe that we will see a state operated virtual currency? And what role do you think a California public bank would play in serving the underbanked or underbanked population? Uh, look, it's possible. Uh, but you have to manage expectations. You have to understand that we are in the infancy of passing these types of policies to legitimize this, this industry. I mean, you know, you're t you, you heard from Majority Leader Hertzberg, and he is probably the one that is most intimately involved in the privacy discussions uh, 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 in California on, on those policies. Uh, but, you know, you can't have one without the other. And, you know, we have to shore up and make not just consumers or people, but members feel confident and comfortable that we have a system in place that, that isn't going to be exploited and that, and that people aren't going to be, is not going to be used to, to, to take advantage of people. And there is just, you know, it, it's, it's hard to explain the reaction you get when you go and try to talk to a member about blockchain or cryptocurrency and anything else that can be utilized or done as a result of it. it. It is so far beyond right now their comprehension. It isn't that they're not smart. They're all really smart. It's just that it takes a lot to understand what blockchain is. It takes a lot to understand what a cryptocurrency is and how all of this stuff works together. And there are so many issues that are facing California, so many really huge, important issues uh, that they're not necessarily taking the time, not because they don't care, uh, but they're not taking the time to understand what it would take to create uh, this type of a market uh, and all the different types of things that can come along with it. So is it possible to have a CalCoin one day? Absolutely. And I think at some point in time, you know, it's very likely that we will, but we can't get there until we take this, these steps that we're trying to take now, create comfortability in, around policy making around these issues. That's the only way that we're gonna get there. I mean, sure, you know, you can create a state bank, uh, but we've also created state banks in the past uh, that have not been successful. So, you know, we have to be careful about what direction we go and what that says about the industry. And you have to be very deliberate in the direction uh, that you move. And it is so important uh, at this point in time, uh, in its infancy in terms of policy around these this technology, uh, that you're very, very careful with how you proceed. And so, you know, taking these smaller bites at the apple to create that familiarity, you know, to raise uh, the bar a little bit in terms of where we're at in these technologies in the state. It's just, it's so necessary and just where we're at right now. That doesn't mean we're not going to move on to other places. We certainly will move on uh, to different steps of this technology, but there are just things that have to be done first. And so, uh, yeah, I agree that this is something that can happen. Uh, I just wouldn't expect this to happen anytime soon because there are a lot of steps that are going to have to take place before we can get to that place. 
Yeah, that makes no, that makes sense. I mean, you're right. We, it's baby steps, right? This stuff has been around for over 10 years and, and we're finally getting to a place where people are actually talking about it on a regular basis. And, and so I guess that kind of leads me right into the next topic, which is, you know, regulation of, of these types of businesses. And, you know, we have 50 different states, basically, uh, who have different requirements. Some have none and some have extremely stringent requirements. So, you know, I'm kind of curious as to what you both think about how regulation moves forward and does it become something that's completely federal or to, to harmonize these types of requirements or, you know, how do we move forward to, you know, reconcile states who have more stringent laws so that there's a, a lot of interoperability between, between the states? Following up on what Mr. Calderon said in terms of increment, this is the United States of America. The states are the incubators of democracy. If you look at our history, we've have, and I have in my drawers, different uh, 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 denomination of currencies from different states of the 13 colonies. They had different denominations. They had their own military, militias, and the like. We've, we've seen this maturity of the United States but that starts with the states as the incubators of democracy. Congress, you know, we have a divided government in the United States. It takes a long time to figure out the tensions between the legislative and the executive branches, which was this place was designed. So just like with respect to privacy, a simple example, yes, there's a lot of discussion and certainly businesses or folks that want a harmonized, whether it's a civil rights movement, took 42 times to get past the United States Congress. Everybody wants harmonized laws unless it's not what you want, right? Then they don't want harmonized laws. And so it's, it takes a while to figure it out. And what we've found in California, that we have led the way in banking in many ways, credit card laws, we dealt with issues of uh, 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 Planned Parenthood, some laws that we took and became national laws. Sometimes other states become national laws. It's just kind of the iteration of what Mr. Calderon was saying was happening here in California is also going to happen across the country. And some states will get it right and some states will get it wrong. And ultimately, they'll build a consensus in Congress to be able to deal with it. But it is going to be a challenge. The difference in the technology space versus so many other spaces, when you were running a railroad, it was different because you had to run across state lines. You know, when you're Larry Page and Sergey Brin, they want to build their own island and their own government because they're not, they're in the ether, they're in the clouds. So the dynamic of Bitcoin, the dynamic of where the serving farms are and what it looks like globally really reflect the globalization. But you're right, we're going to have to get there. But as Mr. Calderon said, as it relates even with the state and with the federal across the board, there will be incubating going on among the states and those best ideas will then mature up and hopefully at some point get the support of the federal government. So we have a national policy and then the national policy is gonna fight the international policy. Hence, look at GDPR for privacy, right? What does that look like? Or other kinds of international trade agreements in a globalized economy. It's just the iteration and the maturity of how this process works. I'm actually glad you brought up trade and commerce because right now there's something really unique going on that the ULC as well as the ALI, the American Law Institute, uh, is working on the Joint Study Committee to revise the Uniform Commercial Code, which goes back to how the individual states uh, deal with commerce and trade and, 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 digital, and digital assets now are being brought up as how, how do we deal with this in commerce. And so, you know, the future of digital, of future of commerce is obviously going digital. We already see how big of a role it plays in China and what they're doing with their digital currency, electronic payments network that's, being, that's going to be coming out. So how do you feel about the moment that we are in right now and what can California do to position itself, not only as a leader in federal commerce, but maintain its international presence as well? Hey, Chris, I just, I want, I want to talk, touch real, real quickly a little yeah. bit on what the senator was just saying with regards yeah, to the question. I mean, and I, and I think you, you have to be careful with what you ask for and what you want. You know, you have to think really hard. Do you want this federal government right now to create the laws for your industry? Do you think they are capable of creating laws that you would like uh, and that would be beneficial to this industry right now? I mean, I, I, I right. honestly can say with 100% confidence there is no place more important to this industry right now than the state of California. 
you want to make sure that we are the ones crafting and passing policies that end up becoming what is ultimately adopted by other states and the federal level. If we do something, I will tell, I'll tell you this right now, there are a ton of states that will just adopt what we do verbatim. Look at what Wyoming did. It is so friendly, it is so beneficial to the industry, but not a lot of people are going there. Not a lot of companies are starting there. Some are, but not a lot, because a lot of people don't wanna be in Wyoming. And that's not because it's a bad state, it's just because there are a lot of external factors in terms of resources, education. We have the best education system in the world. You know, being able to have the workforce that you need to push your business forward and create new business. So people want to be in California. Your industry doesn't want, not just want to be in California. They need to be in California. So they need, this industry needs California to pass these policies because it will be what is adopted by other states. And when other states do that, federal government is more likely to adopt what works and it will be a variation if not ex exactly what we've done in California and you may be looking at an option or an opportunity here to do this in the next four years especially uh, you know if President Trump loses and President Biden uh, take uh, Vice President Biden becomes the president of the United States. I think that there's a huge opportunity for a lot of what we've done around privacy, but then also blockchain and cryptocurrency to become more relevant uh, in terms of policies that are adopted nationwide. So I, I just think that if I'm your industry and I'm looking at where do we focus our time, energy, and attention, that doesn't mean you forget everywhere else, but where do we really focus our our attention, you have to be focusing on California. We are the ones that have the greatest impact on what your future is going to look like. And if you're not making that investment in California, you're really leaving yourselves open uh, to having some, some regulations and policies put on the books that may not be very um, uh, opportune, uh, it may not be what you want. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's an excellent point, and I think really from there, I think we pretty much covered everything. So, if there's anything that we didn't get to cover that either one of you would like to to bring up, please please do it now. Just keep your eyes on this kid, Ian Calderon. He may be 35 years old soon, but just keep an eye on him. He's a rock star. I've known him his whole life, and uh, I have a lot of confidence in him. Just Ian Calderon. Don't forget that name. You're going to be hearing a lot of it. Thank you, Majority Leader Hertzberg. Um, and I can't tell you how, how uh, fortunate this industry should feel to have uh, not just myself, but Majority Leader Hertzberg in this conversation. You know, I naturally, uh, being somebody who's younger, the next generation looking at these technologies, uh, I'm someone that you would, that you, you would more, and look, more look at to, to work in this space. But to be able to have Senator Hertzberg, Senator Hertzberg in the Senate he brings a lot of legitimacy to all the work that you're doing because of his background, because of his experience, uh, and because of his reputation. Uh, and so I- Wait I just, a second, and you forgot one thing, my good looks. Extrapping <laughs> good looks, of course. Uh, so I, I just think it's really important that you guys take advantage of, of him and this, these issues that are, uh, are very important to him and his work that he can do in the Senate. I mean, I, look, I, I will say, I, I think the Senate is a more difficult place when it comes to, to, to these issues. But the only reason why we've had success is because we've had him on our side. Uh, and so I, I think moving forward, uh, really engage him. And when you have ideas uh, and you have things that, you know, you think California could do to really benefit not just this state, uh, but also the industry, uh, talk to him, work with him get his thoughts, get his insights, uh, and utilize his expertise because it is second to none in this state. Uh, and you would be losing an immense opportunity to get something uh, beneficial done for your state, uh, beneficial done for your industry in this state. That's, that's awesome. Um, I, I do, I appreciate you both very much um, and all the work that you have done already and continue to do. Uh, the road anybody, warriors. If people, <laughs> if, if people or businesses want to contact you or your offices, how can they go about doing that? Well, Google is a great place to start. Just Google yeah. our name and all of our personal information, including our addresses, I'm sure will pop up. <laughs> That's right. That's it. Just Google us. <laughs> it's not Ian Calderon. 
public officials, the life of a right. public official. All right. Well, thank you again, both for being here. This has right, been a guys. tremendous conversation. I'll talk to you soon, Ian. I want to talk to you. All right, All you right. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.